Hi there. In the previous video, we were playing around with this widget where uh, I'm able to pretend to be a decision tree, so to say. So I could pretend that I was a regression algorithm and as a tree, I might want to make a cut somewhere so I could make a cut there. I could also make another one maybe over here. But what we showed was that by sliding around and by uh, trying out a bunch of values on the X spectrum over here, we were able to get a tree that has a relatively small error. And we also discussed how trees like this don't have to go super deep in order for the boosting effect to have its merit. That said though, I did hint that there was a inefficiency happening. And that's something that I would like to talk about in this video. To make the inefficiency clear though, I will uh, reset this widget and we're gonna talk about what the tree algorithm actually might do. So, just for good measure, uh, we're back at the starting point, if you will. I can uh, slide around and the orange line over here mimics the prediction that we're making and this blue line over here is the pattern that we'd like to predict. We also see the error measure and this is a number we'd like to get as low as possible. So, okay, if I'm the algorithm, how might I go about this? Well, I might start at a place and, you know, I would sort of move around and eventually I would just check, well, for all of these different splits, where is the lowest error? And note, by the way, that right now I'm doing this on one single axis. If there are many features, I might do it on more of these axes. But the main inefficiency at this point is that there are just too many places where I could make the cut. If I think about this x-axis over here, uh, which is the axis at which I'm cutting, technically I could make the cut at every single data point in my training data. And that would mean that if I had 10,000 points, well, I might need to check 10,000 places to make this cut. If I had 100,000 points, then I would need to check even more places. Now you can just kind of see how this doesn't necessarily scale. Sure, I might be able to get the most precise cut uh, for the algorithm, but maybe we can make do with an approximation instead. So here's one idea that we might be able to do. One thing I could do is I could say, well, you know what? Let's just cut up this region into bins. I start at zero, I end at 10 over here. So what if we just cut up this region into five bins like so, and when doing this, I can just pretend that I'm making the cut at the center of each bin. In this case, I would have five buckets to pick from, so the algorithm would need to uh, only try five values. And in this particular case, I actually get a little bit lucky because it just so happens to be the case that I get a pretty good value in the center of this bucket over here. So that kind of works, but then I do here think, well, what if I don't want to get lucky? What if I just want to have a bit more of a guarantee that I actually get a cut that's near a region that I'm interested in? Well, in that case, one thing you can do is just introduce more buckets, really. Instead of five, maybe we should do 10 or even 20. And as you might be able to smell from a distance here, this number of bins that we're making that is a hyperparameter that we can select. We can choose to go more granular. We can choose to have a lower resolution. Those are all things that we can pick. But the main thinking is that even if we had, let's say 256 of these buckets, there will be a pretty good resolution for a bunch of data sets. And this number, most of the time, will be way lower than the number of different values that we might have in a column. If we had 10,000 different values, this histogram will be way faster. And the speed up is actually quite astonishing. So to emphasize that, let's just run a really quick benchmark. And here's some code that can run the benchmark on our behalf. Primarily what this benchmark will do is it will compare the hist gradient boosting regressor implementation with the base gradient boosting regressor. The main difference between these two is that this one just uses the base implementation and this one actually introduces histograms to speed everything up. To make the comparison between these two, I am using the make classification function from the scikit-learn datasets module. And I'm going to make increasingly bigger datasets using this function. And then I'll track both how long it takes to train both of these systems as well as their predictive performance. So I'm looping over all sorts of different sizes below here. I am making my 
classification data set. And then for both of these methods, I am just running this cross val score method over here. So out of this come a couple of values because I'm doing cross validation, but uh, I'm taking the mean, that'll be my proxy for now. And then I'm keeping track of the size, the method, the score, and the time taken. That means that the results that I've got here is a list of dictionaries, which I can easily turn into a data frame, which in turn, I can easily turn into a chart. All of that good stuff is happening via Altair and Polars in the cell block below here. Uh, but let's focus in on the actual chart that I'm making instead, because that's something we can draw our conclusions from. Okay. So on top here is a chart of the time, and on the bottom here is a chart of the score. The blue line represents the base implementation of the boosting algorithm, and the orange line represents the histogram variant. Now, on the x-axis over here, I've got the size of the data set that I'm generating, and I'm showing this on the log scale. And then the y-axis here is telling me how long it takes to train the thing. And here, it's telling me the accuracy score. And there are, seem to be two conclusions on this one data set. For starters, if I were to just zoom in on the score over here, then, you know, there are some more pronounced differences when the data set is relatively small. But the moment the data set gets quite big, the values really do seem to be close to one another. At the end here, it seems that the histogram variant is even a bit on top, though it might not be statistically relevant. The main thing that the bottom chart is telling me is that the predictive performance of both models seem to be in the same ballpark. However, if I look at the time it takes to train, there is a big difference. Compared to this blue line over here, which represents the time it takes to train the base model, this histogram line over here almost feels like a flat line close to zero. And if we zoom in, then we can see that originally both of these implementations are very similar to one another when the data set just isn't that big. But the moment the data set gets bigger and bigger, it's going to start deviating more and more and more until we get this final chart where it's just very easy to see that the base algorithm doesn't necessarily scale. Like the more data points we get, the more time it takes to actually make cuts over all of these separate data points and figure out where to make the most optimal cut. The histogram implementation suffers way less from this, which is why it's so much faster to train, even though the performance is definitely still in the same ballpark. After seeing this benchmark, it might be less surprising now to know that if you were to go to the gradient boosting regressor documentation page, again, that's the algorithm without the histogram, then you actually see a bit of a warning. The docs tell you that the histogram variant tends to be much faster to train for data sets that have over 10,000 samples. Now, if you were to click this link, you will notice another fun fact, namely that this implementation that you see over here is inspired by another library called LightGBM. There are packages besides scikit-learn that offer models that do this gradient boosting with histograms, if I recall correctly, XGBoost has that feature, but so does LightGPM. It's just that this particular implementation served as the inspiration for the scikit-learn authors when they started exploring these histogram approaches. In fact, and I think it's a fun little history lesson, you can actually find the original implementation for this histogram boosted model in this repository on GitHub. What's interesting here is that folks looked at the LightGBM implementation and they thought, well, maybe we can get something like that for scikit-learn as well. And they explored an implementation that involves Numba, which is a likable just-in-time compiler tool. And even though the benchmarks looked really good, in the end, this implementation got changed because scikit-learn has Scython internals. And given the prevalence of Scython, it felt a bit simpler not to add Numba as a dependency to core scikit-learn. But I do think there's an interesting history lesson here, basically because it shows how the ecosystem of tools learns from one another. There were different implementations of this boosting algorithm over time, and it's interesting to see how people were trying to learn from each other's projects. That said though, the main point of this video is to point out that if you are interested in using boosting, this histogram variant is the thing you should reach for. 
The old implementation is still around, but so far the benchmarks seem to be quite convincing that using this variant is just going to be a whole lot quicker. And it's always nice to see training loops that don't take forever to run. So if you are still using this, and if you are suffering a little bit from the long training times, definitely give this histogram variant a shot.